tragedies, catastrophes, and all kinds of other news that's fit or unfit to print. What do you got for me? Anything interesting today? Going once, going twice, I see no hands. Okay, I had a question via email and I thought I would share it with you. And this is kind of a little bit of background. We are hearing a lot today, these days, last few days, about war crimes. Uh, up to now, it has been pretty much uh, just uh, suspicions and such and so. But uh, after the Russians moved out of uh, Buska, uh, a suburb of uh, Kiev, um, pretty much uh, evidence uh, pretty in uh, pretty uh, incontrovertible, as they say, uh, substantial in uh, evidence of uh, war crimes. Uh, now the question to me was twofold, which is uh, what are the rules of war, and uh, how do they are they are there any rules of war in the Bible? Kind of a two pronged question. Um, as to the first question, the rules of war, what I did is uh, went uh, and got some information, uh, collected a bunch of information from the internet uh, and books that I had, and uh, kind of put down a summary uh, of uh, this. Now, if you want to read the actual language, uh, the very legal language of the Geneva Convention, you can find that on the internet just about anywhere. Uh, just put in your search uh, uh, Geneva Convention. Uh, there are many additions to the Geneva Convention. Uh, you can start even uh, with the Hague Conventions too. Uh, Hague uh, it's, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, the capital of the Netherlands, H-A-U-H-U-A-G-E, I believe. Anyway, uh, there have been rules of war pretty much since the Crimean War. Uh, does anybody remember when that was? Not, not the recent one. Not, no, not, not 2014, right. no, no. Uh, Crimea is, as you know, this little hangy down part that hangs down into the Black Sea. Uh, there was a war there uh, in the 1850s, 1850s, between uh, the combined nations of uh, France and England, along with a couple others, but those were the major combatants uh, fighting Russia. Uh, and uh, that's where the famous uh, uh, light, um, the, uh, the uh, light brigade, uh, charge of the light brigade took place at Balaclava, which is a port city in uh, Crimea. Uh, the charge of the 600. Um, you can look that up, that's a fun thing to read. Uh, Lord uh, Tennyson wrote that. Anyway, um, during the Crimean War, it uh, became evident to observers that um, things were being done that civilized people don't do. Now, I, I know that sounds kind of weird uh, in a war. Um, you've probably all seen uh, Bridge on the River Kwai. And you remember when uh, the colonel uh, uh, kept saying to the uh, Japanese commander, he had a copy of the Geneva Convention, and he, he would say, but the Geneva Convention says, and the, the uh, Japanese commander knocked it out of his hand and said, what do you know of rules of war? Uh, you know nothing of the code of the Bushido. And uh, so... The nations of the Western powers, uh, especially the Western powers, uh, I guess you could say maybe the Christian powers, if you would, um, they began to feel guilty, conscious bound, whatever, when they saw some of the horrors of war. Now, it is, it is odd, I guess, to me anyway, as a historian, it is rather interesting to me that uh, this took 1850 years uh, in the new millennia, uh, for this to happen. Uh, there were no rules up to that time. 
uh, and it was understood by everybody that war was war and that there was no, that there were no rules and that you did whatever you felt was necessary to win. It was win at all costs. Uh, you want to see examples of that? Look at the Crusades. Uh, Crusades are perfect examples of that. Butchery on both sides, uh, mostly, frankly, on the Christian side. Uh, Christians were very brutal uh, to the Muslims, more so than the Muslims to the Christians. But they were both. Both sides were, were very brutal. Uh, cutting people's heads off, civ killing civilians, uh, ripping people uh, open to get jewels out of them that they swallowed. Uh, I mean, it was just it was hor horrendous. Um, this was true of war. All, all through that, up to that time, and from that time forward. If you want another example, uh, you can look at the Thirty Years' War. The Thirty Years' War uh, between the Protestants and the, and the Roman armies uh, during the, uh, after, right after the Reformation, a hundred years after the Reformation. Uh, absolute terrible brutality. Um, uh, and, and the Romans, uh, uh, or as we call them Catholics, didn't think twice. Uh, about murdering uh, whole cities of civilians. Uh, and neither did the Protestants, for that matter, think twice about murdering entire cities of civilians on the Roman side. Uh, there was no rules. There was no rules. Uh, the wars, especially in the wars of religion, uh, when you got Muslim against Christian or Roman against Lutheran, uh, Protestant against Catholic, uh, there are no rules. You, you know, if you go to war with somebody, you beat them up. You beat them up until they stop fighting. You, you beat them up until they're dead. And you kill as many of them as you possibly can. That's, that, that's it, okay? So during the Crimean War, though, uh, people began to feel squeamish uh, about uh, the way prisoners were treated, uh, the way civilians were attacked, uh, and things like that. And so the, uh, by that time, there was this group called the International Committee of the Red Cross. And uh, years later, decades later, there was a Red Crescent, which was the same thing, but for Muslim countries. Um, so the Red Cross, uh, people in the Red Cross, uh, Clara Barton, you know, big famous, uh, famous woman in the Red Cross, and others began to lobby uh, governments to say, look, uh, okay, we understand that sometimes diplomacy fails and, and that sometimes you feel the need for whatever reason to go to war. Okay, fine. But let's keep it civilized. Okay. Let, let's keep it. And, and you understand, of course, this is during the Victorian age. Uh, uh, Queen Victoria comes to the throne in 1837. Okay, the Crimean War starts about 1850, 51, uh, and uh, goes on for about four years or so. Um, and, and so in, uh, during the Victorian age, when, when Queen Victoria is there, and, and you realize that she is related to many of the uh, uh, royal houses of, of uh, Europe uh, through marriage, uh, through uh, uh, marrying uh, Prince Albert, um, and then her children, of course, start marrying in to various royal houses. And so uh, certainly by the 1870s and 1880s, by the time we get to the Franco-Prussian War, uh, for example, everybody's related to everybody. And First World War, same thing. Everybody's related to everybody. Uh, on the internet, I saw just the other day uh, an interesting picture, a photograph, taken at the, um, uh, at the uh, funeral of uh, King Edward, King Edward VIII, uh, who was the king right after Victoria. And uh, the Edwardian era, he only reigned for nine years, I think maybe ten, no, yeah, nine, nine, about nine years. But it's called the Edwardian era. And that was right before the First World War. Uh, he died in, I think, 1910, 1911, somewhere around there. And um, there's a picture of him and uh, nine, I think, other kings. Uh, about the only important king that wasn't there was the Tsar of Russia. And the Tsar of Russia was a very close related, very close related to George. But the king of Prussia, uh, Wilhelm, uh, was there. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm was there. Uh, the, the kings of Greece and, and, and the Netherlands and Belgium and uh, uh, oh, Denmark, uh, Norway, Sweden, 
All the countries that were later, most of which were later involved in World War I, were, there was a picture of them all sitting, all the kings were all sitting there in, in a room, and a photograph was taken of them all. And that was the last time that all these relatives, all these cousins, uh, got together before the First World War, which pretty much uh, put the kibosh on the whole thing. After that, of course, there was revolutions everywhere, and a lot of monarchies fell. But anyway, um, so during this time when people are related to people and Victoria is very genteel and she wants to do a lot of Christian mission work and she wants to Christianize as much of the world, uh, this is why Clara Barton and Red Cross and other people uh, looked upon war and, and said, look, uh, we can do this better. If we have to, if we absolutely positively have to do it, we can at least do it better. We can at least do it more civilized. We can at least be gentlemen about it. Okay. So, uh, what we have then is the Geneva Convention, uh, and then that is amended numerous times. Uh, the last amendment, I believe, was 2007, was the last time that the Geneva Convention was added to, and I think that's when the landmine thing was added, I believe, but I could be, I could be wrong about that. All right. Let's just look at these real quick. I'm not going to read the whole thing. And this is just for your information as you're reading newspaper reports, as you're seeing the news, you can have something to refer to when they talk about war crimes, okay? No targeting of civilians, okay? Uh, so you can't specifically uh, go after ununiformed people, right? Uniforms are... are uh, become extremely important in this. And when you read the Geneva Convention itself, you will see that they make a really big deal about who's in uniform and who's not. Now, of course, wars before this, sometimes there were no uniforms. The uniforms are kind of a, a modern thing. They didn't really start being used, per se, until the well, six, 15, 16, 1700s. So for, for a thousand and a half years, uh, uniforms were sometimes there, sometimes not. More often not. Uh, more often you would just call the peasants up, uh, call the serfs to war, and they wore whatever they had. Uh, and sometimes they used whatever weapons they had. Uh, you see this a lot in the, uh, in the various uh, revolutions and civil wars in England, for example, in the, in the Middle Ages. And in the Hundred Years' War between France and England, it would be very difficult to tell uh, if, if you or I were asked, who's who? Who's the British and who, who's the English and who's the French? It, looking at soldiers, you would be, you would be hard pressed to tell. Uh, so uh, when the Geneva Convention came out, they made a big deal about make sure you have a uniform on. Because if you have a uniform on, then uh, these rules apply in a certain way. If you do not have a uniform on, then uh, the other rules apply. And so then you become a civilian. This explains why in some wars uh, over the years, uh, some countries uh, and some uh, insurgencies especially have uh, uh, eschewed or, or refused to use uniforms. Uh, this way they can be considered civilians and they can take advantage of that. And then you round up a bunch of civilians that are really not civilians and you go to... Uh, march them off to a, uh, to a place uh, to keep them or whatever, and uh, they break out their uh, hidden uh, knives and uh, guns and shoot you and kill you. And th this, was, this, was a, this is a big problem. This is a big problem. And guerrillas are a big problem. Uh, uh, guerrilla warfare is a big problem. Geneva Convention deals with this stuff, but probably nobody pays any attention to it. Uh, that, that's another thing I need to add about this uh, right away. I should have added to begin with. A lot of people on both sides of a conflict take the attitude of, uh, of that Japanese uh, prison war uh, commandant, okay, who said, there are no rules of war. You know? A lot of people take that attitude, including what people in the West, uh, when it's convenient. In other words, when they want to, they can do that. Uh, or, they, well, they're not supposed to, but, but they do. So, for example, I'll give you a great example. Uh, during the First World War, okay, one of the things that was forbidden uh, was inhumane weapons, and you see those down there. Uh, and by this time, of course, by the time, by 1917, let's say, 
Um, there are uh, uh, advances in weaponry that, uh, that uh, produce things like uh, gas and biological weapons uh, and things like that. Uh, and uh, you weren't supposed to use those. Uh, and after the war, it was, made, it, made, it was specifically stated in the Geneva Convention, you could not use gas. That's why, in case you're ever interested, uh, you know, both sides in the World War II had gas weapons. Both sides did, but neither side used them. And it was always thought that if any side would use the gas weapons, it would be uh, Germany, because Germany was the first to use it in the First World War. And they didn't pay any attention to the Hague Convention. The Hague Convention in 1907 outlawed the use of uh, gas in warfare. Uh, and the Germans basically said, pooey to you, if that's what we need to win, that's what we're going to do. So that's a perfect example of uh, people, you know, you, you get together, you have a meeting, you agree to a bunch of stuff, everybody signs it. Uh, by the way, I can tell you this, 197 nations, 197 nations on the earth have all signed the Geneva Convention. That's just about all of them. I, I, I'm not sure, I didn't check to see who was left out. But uh, that, is the, that is the most comprehensive uh, agreement on the face of the planet. That's more comprehensive than the United Nations treaties. So the International Red Cross and Red Crescent have got 197 nations to agree to the Geneva Convention. That's pretty amazing. I mean, it really is. But I can tell you right now, half of those countries or more have broken it numerous times already. But it's the time they signed it including the United States, including the United States, okay? Uh, so, uh, but the, the, the first thing they wanted to do was get the civilians out of the way. Uh, one of the reasons for this was because of the British. Uh, the British uh, invented um, what's called uh, total warfare. The British invented that. It wasn't invented by the Germans, the Huns, or the Nazis, or the Japanese, or the Chinese. It was invented by our dear good friends, our cousins across the way, our nice British buddies. Uh, and especially by one man. One man is responsible for what's called total warfare. Uh, and he influenced guys like William Tecumseh Sherman quite a bit. And his name was Lord Wellington. Lord Wellington was the first, as far as we know, in somewhat modern times, to specifically target the infrastructure, the civilian infrastructure of the enemy. Uh, he bombarded uh, the Netherlands, uh, cities in the Netherlands along the coast during, mm -hmm. during the Napoleonic Wars. The Netherlands, as you might know, was an ally of Napoleon. Uh, in any case, he, he bombarded the cities. No, no troops there. No uh, 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 enemy ships or warships uh, around. He bombarded the cities. And when, when the uh, uh, captains of his ships uh, balked, you know, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. There's no, there's the enemy, there's no enemy there. And Napoleon and uh, Wellington said, uh, we're going to smash them into uh, surrender. We're going to smash them uh, into, uh, uh, to comply with us. Uh, to, we'll teach them to side with the wrong guy, basically. He did the same thing in Portugal and Spain, uh, and later in France itself. Uh, so our, our dear friend, uh, Lord Wellington, uh, the, the winner of Waterloo, the hero of uh, Anglophiles everywhere, uh, is the one man most responsible for what's called total warfare. Uh, this explains also, by the way, this also explains uh, the Eighth Air Force and the Royal Air Force in their attack on Germany, uh, very often skipping uh, military targets and hitting civilian targets on purpose. The best example of that, of course, is Dresden. And uh, that was a horrific, terrible war crime. The people who participated who ordered the bombing, firebombing of Dresden should have been uh, should have been brought up on charges and frankly, in my opinion, should have been executed. The same thing for the firebombing of Tokyo. That was totally against uh, the Geneva Convention. Totally and completely. 
But uh, Colonel LeMay, who was uh, in charge of that particular operation, uh, basically he had the same attitude as Wellington. Too bad. Yes? Wasn't the head of Shima and Nagasaki the same? Yeah, you, you, I, yeah, there's no question about that. Uh, if, you, if you read uh, what the targets were, uh, you know, they did not target military areas really. Well, they did in Nagasaki, but it was an army base with 1,000 soldiers. Yeah, it, it, that, that was an excuse. Yeah, exactly. uh, it, the Hiroshima one in particular, uh, the target was a building in the middle of town, uh, and it was specifically targeted because it would be uh, the center of uh, destruction. So uh, again, uh, if the Geneva Convention were applied equally across the board, then American generals like LeMay would have been executed. But of course, you know what they say about history? Who writes history? The winners, yeah. And it's the same with the Geneva Convention, okay? Uh, the winners uh, decide who breaks the rules. Right? But anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, so, so no targeting civilians. Notice there is a kind of a caveat down there in the second paragraph. If the expected incidental civilian damage of an attack is excessive and disproportionate to the military uh, gain, then the attack legally cannot be carried out. Uh, now, the military people will tell you, well, we don't know that until after the attack. <laughs> Okay, so uh, these rules, especially if you read them in their original, uh, in their original uh, legalistic language, are, 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 are get crazy. I, I don't know how anybody uh, manages to understand them. Um, uh, notice the caveat. A civilian structure school may become a legitimate target if it is being used for specific military operations, such as a base to launch attacks and store weapons. And countries do this all the time. They're forever using hospitals and schools to store uh, munitions uh, or to set up uh, anti-aircraft uh, weapons and things like that. And uh, even though that's against the Geneva Convention, they do it anyway. And then, of course, when the school or hospital gets bombed, then they scream bloody murder and say, hey, you attacked school or hospital. So, uh, like I say, you know, uh, the problem with rules is there's always some guy out there who wants to break up and get away with it. No torture or in inhumane treatment of detainees, okay? Uh, now, notice it doesn't say prisoners. Uh, you know, the prisoners, the whole prisoner thing is a, is a murky area because, again, a guy out of uniform but who's fighting, let's say right now. Let's say, uh, there's, there's the, last I heard, there were about 5,000 Americans, uh, ex-soldiers or whatever, fighting for Ukraine. Now, smart, very wisely, the Ukrainians are not just taking them and handing them an AK-47 and say, go over there and shoot. Um, the U Ukrainians are taking these people in, they're, they're finding out whether they have military experience or not. If they have military experience, in other words, if they were, if they, they can show I have a military ID and, and I was in this battalion or that regiment or that Air Force or whatever, then, then they give them a uniform. They give them a uniform or at least they give them an armband, Ukrainian armband, uh, so, they can, so they're marked as Ukrainian soldiers. That's smart. Okay? That, that's, that's going according to the Geneva Convention. Uh, if they don't have military experience, they send them to go, you know, lug supplies and maybe if they have time, train them a little bit. Um, they do the same with their own people. Uh, their own people who are volunteering, men, women, and children volunteering to fight, same thing. If, if you have reserve experience or mil military experience, fine, here, you know, we'll put you in a unit and you go fight. If you don't, we're not going to use you on the front, okay, which is, which is smart. Um, so they have to be given food and water, protected from violence, and allowed to communicate with their families. There are no exceptions to this rule. You no, know, I want you to look at that sentence. There are no exceptions to this rule, even when torture might elicit life-saving information. This is why uh, people complain about uh, Guantanamo. This is why people complain about the CIA torturing people. This is why. Uh, 
the, the uh, feeling among uh, our people, our military people, uh, is that if we can elicit uh, plans for a uh, strike of some kind from somebody, then there are no, all, uh, no holes barred. You do whatever it takes to get that information. And again, that's illegal. This is why the, the soldiers, the American soldiers in charge of uh, El Grab prison in uh, Iraq were uh, court-martialed uh, because they were using uh, electrodes uh, to torture uh, Iraqi soldiers to get information out of them. And this was uncovered. Um, so, uh, you know, again, both sides do this stuff. Uh, it, it just so happens that a lot of times on our side, uh, we have more uh, uh, leakers <laughs> than the other side. Uh, and uh, so our leakers, they take, uh, uh, you know, uh, phone pictures and whatever of some of this stuff, and then those guys get in trouble. And the guys at Guantanamo, uh, some of them got in trouble too. Uh, and, and, you know, you or I sit here and you say, well, if they uncover another 9-11, then, then good for them. Um, and, and I understand that, you know, again, that's, that's what Wellington basically said. Hey, if we can shorten the war by, by bombing a hotel in the Netherlands full of, uh, uh vacationing generals, uh, Napoleonic generals, uh, good for us. Okay. Uh, that's, that was, that's the military thinking. The military thinking is one way. The civilian thinking, uh, is another way. And, and the two often clash. And, and this is not an easy thing to work through. Okay? And that's why I say both sides break this rule all the time. So when you hear people screaming and yelling about uh, executed civilians in Bushka, okay, understand that the same thing has happened on the other side in the past. And um, to call the Russians more brutal than somebody else is not accurate historically. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, like I said, the, the examples are all through history. Good grief. So. Uh, no attacking hospitals and aid workers. Number three, wounded and sick need to be cared for regardless of what side they're on. Medical workers on duty in these areas uh, are considered natural. Uh, uh, second paragraph, if combatants see a red cross or red crescent, uh, they should know the person or should not be attacked. And of course, uh, um, you know, this is, this is common, but uh, in World War II, I can tell you, my father uh, participated in World War II, and he said uh, the Japanese snipers very often aimed for people wearing red crosses. The corpsmen. Why? There are two reasons. One, the corpsmen rescue these guys, and, and in many cases, uh, these guys then, uh, like my dad, was wounded three times, has three Purple Hearts, and and went back to was sent back to combat each time. So if 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 a corpsman comes and gets you, and you've got a wound somewhere, your arm or leg or whatever, and, and you get you get back to health, and you get sent back into the into the into the fight, if the if the uh, if the sniper can take out the corpsman so that you don't get saved. That's, that's, a double, that's a double whammy. That, that's an extra hit, see? And the other thing is, it's very demoralizing. He said, he said it was really demoralizing uh, to have these guys with, and they don't have any weapons on them, because that's against the Geneva Convention. They can't carry guns. So they go out in the middle of a battle, you know, and, and they rescue these wounded soldiers uh, uh, to, to get them fixed up, you know, and uh, they don't come back, or you see them uh, uh, shot in the head, uh, right through the right through the Red Cross on their helmet uh, by the enemy. And uh, uh, whoa! If I get wounded, who's going to come and get me? It really demoralizes the the troops. And so uh, the Germans did the same thing. The Germans did the exact same thing. Uh, so uh, you know, again. Uh, you know, you've got this. You've got this tussle between these two things: war, win the war at all costs, make the war shorter, basically, uh, or uh, play by the rules uh, and and be a gentleman about everything. But maybe that extends the war 
by months or years. Those are, those, that's, that's the conflict. Okay? Provide safe passage for civilians to flee. Uh, the Russians have been doing this uh, a lot. They say, we're going to provide you a core uh, out of uh, uh, Marisco, for example. Uh, and then as soon as the people start down the core, they start bombing it. Okay? Uh, they do that on purpose. They do that on purpose. Again, very demoralizing. Extremely demoralizing. Uh, uh, what it does, however, in some cases, is then when the news gets back to other people, it makes them furious. And it, it makes them fight harder. So, you know, again, you got two sides here. Uh, number five, provide access to humanitarian organizations. Civilians and militants who are no longer fighting have the right to receive the help they need. Uh, medical food, care, uh, water, shelter. Restricting delivery of humanitarian aid through naval air blockades, closing ports, or confiscating supplies is prohibited. So when a country blockades a port to keep food out, that is against the Geneva Convention, which is exactly what we did to Japan. Uh, the, uh, there's a, there was a, I can't, I can't remember the name of the operation, but there was an operation at the end of the, toward the end of the war, starting in January 45, uh, sending huge numbers of, of submarines. Not, not two, three, four, but dozens and dozens of submarines. The United States, you may not know this, folks, but the United States uh, uh, followed the lead of the Nazis in having wolf packs. The United States Navy, in their submarine warfare, used the tactic of wolf packs in the Sea of Japan. That is that body of water between Japan and China. Realized that after, uh, by the time of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, China had still not been liberated. In other words, uh, the raw materials, food, and whatever that was grown in Manchuria was still being shipped to Japan across the Sea of Japan. And the Sea of Japan was referred to at the time as a Japanese lake. Uh, the, the, the American military decided they were going to put a complete embargo, not just oil now, which is what started the war in the first place, but food supplies. Uh, do you know more American prisoners were killed by American submarines than by their Japanese captors? Mm -hmm. A number of American ships were purposely, purposely torpedoed. The captain knew that the ships he was firing on held American prisoners and fired on them anyway. Because the idea was you eliminate the shipping, the Japanese shipping. The ship was more valuable than the cargo. And I, I have always wished I could find this pamphlet that was given to my dad uh, at Fort Ord uh, before he shipped out uh, uh, from basic training. And it said very specifically, we will do nothing to get you back. If you are taken prisoner, your only job is to escape. And we will expend no material, no man hours, not a single bullet. And if it means we have to bomb your compound or sink the ship you're on, we will do so. You're on your own. That's what the American soldiers were told. They left basic training to go uh, fight. And again, that's total war, folks. That's... No holds barred. Okay? Uh, and number six, no unnecessary or excessive loss and suffering. That's one of the newer ones added. The tactics and weapons used must be proportionate and necessary to achieve a definite military objective. <laughs> I love that wording. The use of weapons that are by nature indiscriminate, according to the Geneva Convention, is prohibited. What's more dis indiscriminate than an atomic bomb? <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean... This is crazy, right? What's more indiscriminate than carpet bombing? What's more indiscriminate than napalm? I mean, yeah. Uh, if, if you were to, if you were to, if you were to apply the Geneva Convention across the board to every conflict and every side of every conflict, there wouldn't be enough gallows to hang all the generals. 
Okay, all right. Real quick, oh poop! Real quick, I want you. I want to look at Deuteronomy chapter twenty. Real quick, just take a few minutes here. Uh, find page three nineteen in your Bibles. Three one nine. The person asks, are there rules in the Bible for warfare? Now, when you're talking about war, of course, uh, and you're talking about the Bible, there's two ways the Bible speaks of war. Uh, Jesus, of course, speaks about war, but he speaks about war as one of those things that is going to be the sign of the end. As wars increase, uh, we know we're in the last days. So we know that. But we've been in the last days since Pentecost pretty much anyway. So, or at least since uh, 500 A.D. So uh, um, that's the one way the Bible talks about war, as a consequence of sin and as part of the signs of the last day. The other way the Bible talks about war, of course, is in the Old Testament, where we have a theocracy, that is, a government that is being run directly by God. God is speaking to the high priest, or later on, God is speaking directly to the king, to King Saul, to King David, to King Solomon, and so on and so forth. And later, then when the kings got kind of rotten, then he would speak through the prophets. But many times the prophets were sent to the kings to talk to the kings. And this is again, this was still a theocracy. Even though the kings were head of the government, God was still considered to be the ultimate authority. Okay, so it was a theocracy. We don't have any theocracies today, at least Christians don't. We have a theocracy, of course, in Iran and, and Pakistan, but that's, that's a false god, so we don't consider that. But anyway, uh, and so I have to understand, when we talk about these rules of war in the Bible, uh, there's no rules in the New Testament, but, but uh, the, the, the general rule in the New Testament, the golden rule, treat others as you would have them treat you, that applies across the board to wars and everything else. And so... That's the war. That, that, if there is a biblical rule for war in the New Testament, that's what it is. Treat others as you would have them treat you, which I guess that's a gene of a convention, I guess. Uh, but it may be more so. Basically, you wouldn't go to war at all, would you? So, yeah. So, anyway, uh, Deuteronomy 20 is an example, or is the, the example in the Old Testament, about God making rules for warfare. Okay? When you go to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. Okay, so and so. Uh, number two, verse two. When you are approaching the battle, priests shall come near and speak to the people. So one of the, one of the things. First of all, don't be afraid. When you have to go to war, go to war, and and don't don't worry don't worry about who has war tanks. In other words, don't don't worry about that. Secondly. Um, uh, start a spiritual start start on a spiritual basis. Start with prayer, I guess you could say. Third, um, th verse three, uh, you are, do not be panicked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the officers, verse five, saying the same thing. Um, uh, look at verse five a little bit. Um, who is the man who has built a new house or has not dedicated it? Let him depart and return to his house. Uh, otherwise, he might die in the battle. Another man would dedicate it. Uh, it was very important to dedicate homes. You dedicated them to the Lord, uh, and uh, God did, did not want people to have a brand new house uh, and uh, not be able to live in it a little bit. Uh, the man who's planted a vineyard, let him depart. Uh, the man who is engaged to a woman has not married her, let him depart. Notice what it is. In other words, uh, God gave deferments. And these weren't physical deferments. You might say these were deferments of convenience. You know, I, gee, I just built a new house, I just started a new job, you know, I, I just got engaged or I just got married. Uh, and God said, that's fine, that's fine. Let, let those people stay home. I think that's very interesting coming from God, don't you? I, I think that's kind of fascinating. Uh, uh, verse 8, the officers speak further to the people. If there's a man who's afraid and faint-hearted, let him depart and return to his house. I mean, can you imagine that? Hey, anybody out there cowards? Anybody out there not want to get shot? That's <laughs> ah, okay, you can go. All right? Can you imagine such a thing? Um, 
And then uh, finish me, uh, they shall appoint commanders of armies, the heads of the people. And notice, you shall appoint the commanders. What does that tell you? Yeah, which means? Well, it means there's no standing army. There's no standing army. Army. By standing army, I mean there's no permanent military. Do you know that that was number one among the signers of the Inde Declaration of Independence as to what they wanted to prevent? Yes. And in the Articles of Confederation, and the Declaration of Independence, it was laid out very clearly, there shall be no standing army. The founders of this country did not want a permanent military. And you can read, just, just go standing army founding fathers in your internet search. You will be amazed. You will be amazed at the number of guys, guys that we all claim to look up to, guys like Madison and Jefferson, guy, guys like Hamilton and, and Washington and the rest of them, uh, and all the Adams boys. Uh, you will be shocked when you hear them talk, absolutely not, no standing army, no way. Standing armies, I think it was Madison, I, th I think it was Madison who said standing armies are the first uh, thing uh, that you want to avoid if you want to maintain liberty. In other words, it was, and that's why, by the way, for those of you fascinated with the Second Amendment, that's why it says what it does. A militia being required, you shall not infringe upon the owning of uh, weapons. Because the entire intent of the country from the beginning, including the Constitution, from the very beginning, the, the, the intention of the country was to never, ever, ever have a standing army. To have every man in his house be ready, willing, and able, and, and trained to go to war at a moment's notice. That's it. That was your army. That's the way they wanted it. Like Switzerland is today, exactly. Like Switzerland is today. That is what our founding fathers insisted upon. But it was only after the War of 1812 when they decided, hmm, oh, I guess not such a good idea. <laughs> and we, of course, been in trouble ever since. <laughs> Then, then, of course, when you get to Eisenhower, you have Eisenhower giving a famous speech about the military-industrial complex, which is very true, of course. But, uh, yeah, uh, so I, I think this is, it's kind of fascinating to, to understand that. Most people do not know that. Um, now, when you approach a city to fight against it, you shall offer terms of peace. First thing you do, hey, guys, hey, let's talk about Let's surrender and talk about this, okay? Let's, 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 let's meet and, and chat. Okay. If it agrees to make peace with you and opens to you, then all the people who found it shall become forced labor and shall serve you. That's interesting, isn't it? In other words, if they surrender without a fight, well, you don't kill them, obviously, but you can enslave them. Now, now understand, this is, this is believers going to war with unbelievers. Uh, this is not, uh, God is not intending this tribal war, inner tribal warfare so is that zebulon taken on naphtali for example or anything like that yeah uh deuteronomy 20. i'm sorry however if it does not make peace with you but makes war against you then you shall besiege it now how are you going to know if it makes war against you it just says no i guess or i suppose you could say if they start shooting arrows at you i guess it you know then the Lord your God gives it into your hand. You shall strike all the men in it with the edge of the sword. 
Only the women and children and animals and all that is in the city, all of that is spoiled to you, shall take as booty. You shall use the spoil uh, of your enemies, which the Lord as God has given you. Thus shall you do to all the cities that are very far from you, which are not cities of those nations nearby. Only in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you an inheritance, you shall not leave alive anything that breathes. Okay, so within the borders of Israel, if there's a city that holds out, it's, a, it's within the borders, it's in the, the area that God designated as uh, His uh, land for His people, and there's a city that's still pagan and holds out, you kill everybody, men, women, children, animals included. No holds barred, total warfare. If, on the other hand, the city that you're going to war against is in Syria or uh, you know, uh, Aram or, you know, not within the borders of uh, what God designated as Israel. Then you just kill the men. You kill them all, <laughs> but, you know, but you kill them, but, but just the men. You shall utterly destroy, and then he gives you the list of the pagans there, uh, so that they may not teach you to according to their detestable things. In other words, you, you, you get rid of all those people within your borders who oppose uh, God. When you, be, when you besiege a city a long time to make war against or to capture it, you shall not destroy its trees by swinging an axe against them, for you may eat from them, and don't cut them down. Whereas the tree of the field, a man, that it should be besieged by you. In other words, you know, don't destroy the territory. Don't, don't destroy the, the, the... In other words, uh, uh, what, what is referred to very often as, uh, you know, a uh, burnt field, you know, uh, that kind of warfare, no, don't do that. Uh, Sherman's march to the sea. Uh, Napoleon's march through Spain, which Sherman patterned his march after, uh, where you destroy everything. Okay. Uh, the Russians uh, uh, retreating in front of the Nazis, destroying everything. Okay. Uh, the Bible says don't do that. That, that wheat or, or that uh, tree or whatever didn't do anything to you, uh, th that's foolish to do that. Only the trees which you know are not fruit trees you shall cut down and destroy that you may construct siege works. So you can use uh, trees that don't produce fruit of whatever kind. Those you can use to build your, your siege machines. Okay. And, and that's it. Chapter 20, Deuteronomy, those are the biblical rules of war. So there's some, you know, there's some idea about that in here. Uh, but again, that's a theocracy. God had his reasons for killing men, women, and children of the pagans uh, and killing all the men uh, of another uh, city far away and so on and so forth. He had his reasons for that. And of course, those were God's reasons. And so they're perfect and good. Uh, but of course, uh, we're not led by God today, unfortunately. So, uh, well, questions, comments? Let's try and finish uh, page 18 anyway. We're still talking about the first half of chapter 2 in Romans. Talking about the uh, section now 12 to 16, verses 12 to 16. And uh, we'll look at those real quick. 12 to 16. Twelve to sixteen reads: For all have sinned without the law, also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law, the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts their consciences bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So basically what Paul is saying there is that this natural law, the conscience, which God gives everybody, unbelievers and believers, both, the conscience or the law written in their heart will be the one to judge them. Okay. And uh, the fact that they have 
the fact that they know to do a right, a good thing, proves that they have the law written in their heart. The fact that they, at least in some cases, know a wrong thing proves the same truth. So when, when pagans make a law and the law says, oh, well, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't murder, okay? And, and they don't refer to God, they don't talk about God at all, they just say, we shouldn't do that. That proves Paul's point. That says, okay, they know better than that. You know, when people do a good deed, when unbelievers do a good deed, you know, when, when they see a, a car on the side of the road and uh, say uh, uh, a young uh, lady, uh, maybe a pregnant young lady, you know, and it's 110 outside, uh, and, and uh, uh, so they stop. And, oh, can I help you? Can I change your tire for you? Can I charge your battery, you know, give you a jump, you know, whatever. Uh, and if the person's a total unbeliever, doesn't believe in Jesus, you know, whatever, uh, that just simply proves Paul's point. That just proves that they know what a good thing is and what a bad thing is. Okay, that, that, that's what he said. So, so nobody can claim, well, to, nobody can claim total ignorance when they're, when they're being a sinner. They can't say, well, I didn't know that was wrong. Yes, you did. You knew darn well that was wrong uh, to kill that person or to steal that thing. Now, today, of course, we look at uh, uh, society and we see people who do not seem to have any conception of right and wrong. Or let's put it this way, their conception of right and wrong is very skewed, all right? Um, a, a good example would be gang members. Okay, let's talk about Los Angeles. I listen to the Los Angeles radio station at night, and they talk a lot about this. Um, are there are there uh, are there good deeds and bad deeds in a gang? Yes, yes, there are. Uh, it, it's like in the mafia, right? Uh, one rule in the mafia. You know what the rule of mafia? The rule of mafia: you never be a rat. Never be a rat. Never rat out. Never rat out your your brothers, your friends. Never never rat out your family. Okay, that's number one rule. Okay, so they know what's right and wrong to tattletale. Okay, to betray a confidence. Okay, they know that's wrong. Um, uh, they were talking about a. They were talking the other day about a case where uh, a record producer, a uh, person, a uh, uh, hip hop record producer, person, black black guy, uh, African American. Um, uh, was making uh, videos or making uh, uh, rap videos for uh, both gangs, the Bloods and the Crips, if you know anything about those uh, in, in L.A. and around the country. Um, and, and so the, uh, both of these gangs, they were, he, the guy was making, uh, uh, was working with both sides. And what they figure happened, because he disappeared and they haven't found his body yet. <laughs> Uh, they figured what happened is one of the one of the other side said, you know, you got to choose. You you got to choose. You got to make side. You got to make you got to make uh, produce produce videos those just for us, not for them. And we those are our enemies. And uh, they figured this guy, uh, being African American, uh, was uh, disloyal. Okay. And and so to the African American uh, gang, one of them is African American. The other is uh, Latin American or, or uh, uh, Hispanic. Okay, I think I'm pretty sure the Hispanics are red. Uh, those are Bloods, and the Blacks are Crips, and that's blue. And you can tell. Don't laugh. I pulled this out. I was teaching. Uh, when I was uh, uh, pastoring in El Paso, I had to teach for a few years because our congregation was kind of strung out and cheap and poor. And so um, I was teaching uh, at Bowie uh, Middle School. And Bowie Middle School is literally the fence of the playground is the international border. Yeah. And so it's right on the border. And, uh, uh, and they gave me gave me for a week, uh, I was a substitute, and they gave me for a week the, uh, the discipline problems, the discipline class, you know. Um, so these were, these were gangbangers, every single one of them. And uh, I, uh, 
I was teaching and it was hotter and blazes in there and the air conditioning, the school's very old, it was built in the 1930s and it was very old and so I was teaching, trying to teach anyway and, and I pulled this out to wipe my head and the Mexican kid in the front row said, eh, hey teach, who did you kill man? <laughs> and, and I said, what? He said, who did you kill? You can't be waving that around man unless you kill somebody. <laughs> Oh, uh, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't kill. Yeah, you better put that back, man. I don't want to see that out again. And if I'd have pulled out a blue one, they probably would have jumped me and beat me to a pulp. So anyway, yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, it, 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 it's not that they don't have a conscience. Understand, even serial killers. Uh, if you talk to uh, experts in this, the serial, they will tell you they have a conscience. They have their own rules of right and wrong. Now they're messed up, <laughs> they're, they're totally wacko, but they have them. That's, that's the point. And that again proves, proves Paul's point. Okay, real quick here, let's uh, get through this. Uh, okay, five minutes. So, verses 12 to 16, Paul enters into a discussion of the place of the law in God's judgment and the fates of those who have his written law and those who do not. So the Jews, of course, have the written law. And, and of course, we would say today, Christians, we have the Bible. And then unbelievers, obviously, even if they have a Bible, if they don't believe it, you know, the, the, then what good is it? Here it will be essential to, to a correct understanding of the section to remember Paul is addressing the Jews who had the law of Moses and that the Gentiles are only mentioned as an illustration to clarify God's relationship with the Jews. And so God, uh, Paul's talking to the Jews. He's not making, the, the Gentile comments are not there specifically for the Gentiles, really, because you can't expect the, the unbelievers to accept these. The point he's trying to make to the Jews is, hey, you guys have an advantage, and you still messed up. That, that's the point he's trying to make. We must also remember the whole purpose of the law is never to lead anyone to salvation. This is somehow not understood by an awful lot of people today. An awful lot of people today. Uh, I was told after my sermon on Sunday, which focused, well, last two Sundays really, I've been focusing very heavily on, on grace. Uh, I was told that um, uh, people who were watching on the internet, there was a conversation around the dinner table, and uh, uh, these people, uh, not members here, but uh, anyway, uh, they, the discussion, and the discussion was, uh, you know, how do you get saved? And uh, the wife of uh, the family uh, answered and said, oh, well, uh, uh, do good. Uh, be kind and work hard. That's how you get to heaven. Do good, be kind, and work hard. Where? <laughs> um, and and one of the teenagers uh, in the group said, "You must not have been listening. That's not what Pastor said." Um, so other people in the group got it, but but the wife did not. And uh, the husband just, I asked, well, what did your dad say? And he just, uh, he just rolled his eyes. Uh... What she, it turns out, she grew up in the Roman church. She doesn't go any church anymore, but she grew up in the Roman church. So that kind of hung around in her head. See? Uh, so the law cannot save. Does not save, cannot save. It's not possible to save. It's not purpose. The purpose is not to save. Okay, uh, but to make people understand their sinful condition. Always remember SOS. Right. The law and gospel. The law shows our sin. The gospel shows our savior. Right? S O S. Real simple. Real easy to remember the difference between law and gospel. Okay? The law shows us our sin, the gospel shows us our Savior. 
Real simple. Okay. Should not be confusing for people, but boy, it sure is. When Paul speaks here about the law, he has the moral law in mind. The Jews, it seems, never really understood the true purpose of the Ten Commandments. Indeed, the law of Moses consisted of more than the Ten Commandments and the other moral instructions laid out in the Torah. We'll stop there. Um, moral law is really, really important to understand when we're talking about the Bible. And I would say more so even in the Old Testament. Understand that God did not give the Ten Commandments or even the ceremonial law, which is not moral law, but even the ceremonial and civil law that God gave, God gave to show how sinful the people were. God knew that they would not be able to keep the Sabbath. God knew they would not be able to keep the sacrificial laws. God knew they would bring lie, blind and lame uh, sacrifices. He knew that. He specifically gave the law, all of the law in the Old Testament, to show how sinful these people were, not to show them a way to salvation. And the Jews never understood this from day one. And secondly, they still, even though they thought the law was there to save them, they still didn't keep it. Talk about stupid. I mean, really, to miss the whole point of giving the law, to think it's there in order for you to show how perfect you are, and then when you mess it up constantly from one end to the other, you don't realize that, that, that you have done that. And, and you still think it's there to, to save your butt. I, I mean, talk about... You know, really, every once in a while, you have to say, God, come on. There was somebody better than Abraham and his bunch that you could have picked. Come on. Nobody's that stupid. Well, obviously they are. And a lot of Christians don't get that to this day. How many people out there consider themselves Christian and are trying to work their way to heaven? Tons and tons of them. Think that by the fact they give up booze or give up drinking uh, or uh, dancing or, or uh, well, I didn't uh, say God's name in vain today. Well, that means I'm one step closer to heaven. Uh, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's mind-blowing how ignorant even Christians can be on this point who are trying to save themselves by being good. It, it just, it, it, it blows my mind. As I said in my sermon, I said, I don't, I don't get it. I, I don't understand. I, I, it, to me, it's crystal clear, but I, I guess I'm just weird. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and the rest of us, too. All right. It's giving the reason that people listen to people, uh, big events. Oh, yeah, I know. Money. They're, they're buying their way. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I suppose. All right, let's close. May the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all. Amen. Thank you. Yep.